Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. Wrestling with faith and doubt can be profoundly lonely and isolating. Some suffer in silence while others abandon belief to get altogether, assuming doubt is incompatible with faith. Dominic Doan believes this is both tragic and deeply mistaken. In his new book, When Faith Fails, Doan writes of his own experience with faith and doubt, using scripture, literature, and the lives of others who have doubted to argue that not only is questioning normal, but it's often a path toward a rich and vibrant faith. Taking up specific issues that often create doubt, the silence of God, the place of science, offensive portions of scriptures, and the problem of suffering. Dominic offers practical ways for Christians to move through doubt into deep faith, a faith that wrestles, celebrates questions, and embraces the mystery of belief. Dominic Doan is lead pastor of one of Portland, Oregon's largest churches, Westside, a Jesus church. Prior to Westside, he pastored churches in North Carolina and Hawaii. He's also taught English for large companies in Europe, lecturing on theology and church history at Christian colleges, and served as a missionary in Vanuatu and Mexico. Dominic has degrees in religion and psychology from Liberty University and a master's of theology from the University of, Ox of, of Oxford. Here to talk about when faith fails, finding God in the shadow of doubt is Dominic Doan. Dominic, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Hello, Rabbi. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, it's an honor to privilege. You know, it is, uh, um, it is the story of Jarius. Uh, you know, Jarius stands before Jesus and talks about his dead daughter. And Jesus mm -hmm. says, what are you worried about, man? What are you concerned about? Your daughter's not sick. Um, and he says, I believe, but forgive yep. my unbelief. And that kind of sets the tone for yeah. a model of a yeah. person of great faith that's struggling yeah. with great faith. That's right. Yeah. And I love how Jesus didn't condemn him for that, uh, but he still healed the daughter and stepped in to the, that, that broken and horrific and painful situation. And didn't have to show up for the jubilation. He didn't have to show up for the yeah. celebration. He didn't have to show up because he already knew in his heart what had taken place. And he had other miracles to perform. This was but one that he would do. But here was a man who was right there in the presence of Jesus and was right. willing to be real, yes. transparent, who said the very words, yes, I believe, but forgive my unbelief. Yeah, This that's is a right. journey that that's you right. take us on that says that it's okay for us to journey through seasons of doubt, but come out the other end with walking into our homes and seeing our dead daughter cooking a meal or up and out playing with their favorite doll and experiencing that. But I wanna take us back on a journey to your early upbringing, to where your faith was founded, what your faith journey was like, and how you came to wrestle with this faith, and how you came out the other end the same way as Jarius. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> well, I, uh, I was born in, in Oxford, England, and you wouldn't know it based on the accent um, because I was only eight years old when we moved to Southern California. And I was born into a home where um, there, there was, a, at that time, a lot of brokenness, a lot of pain. Um, I, I didn't know my biological. Old. I, was, um, I, I wanted my dad. And um, when, when I was eight, moving to Southern California, um, things really imploded in our family and um, saw a lot of brokenness, a lot of pain. Um, my dad at that time was struggling with alcohol and uh, my parents were divorcing. And I didn't have a framework or understand who God was, but I, I did believe there, there had to be a God. And I remember praying uh, for my family. And my mom, she became a Christian. Uh, someone shared the gospel with her 
And uh, she came home and um, she shared with us, my sister and I, and long story short, sent, an, sent us off to a Christian camp. And I heard the gospel really for the first time. And something in my heart just gave um, and opened my heart and became a believer at that point. And so I was about 10 years old then. And every night, my mom and my sister and I, we would get on our knees and we would pray for my dad, who at that time was living elsewhere. And again, they were about to be divorced. And my mom, she always encouraged us that God could answer our prayers and that even though it looked impossible, that God could could heal him and restore him and set him free. And so we did this every single night. We, we prayed for him. And then one night uh, he came over and there was just a brokenness in him. And he sat on the back porch of our house in Vista, California, and uh, cried out to God. And he became a Christian. And my parents literally tore up the divorce paper and they got back together. And um, a few years after that, my dad became a pastor. So it's quite, it's quite the story of, of redemption and, and grace. And so my childhood really was two parts. Um, one part was very broken and difficult. And then the other part was extremely um, religious and um, passionate for, for the gospel. And uh, so it's kind of a, a whiplash right, right around the age of 10 years old. Um, and so I began to devour the Bible and study scripture and go to church and, and hear you know who, who Jesus was and just really fell in love with him, fell in love with, with the Bible, fell in love with God in, in a deep way. Um, as the years kind of went on growing up, um, I'd say uh, through middle school and high school, I, I would say I had, I had a faith in God, a belief in God that was fairly simple and childlike. Um, but there are also some kind of gnawing doubts that um, I, I began to, to wrestle with. And I think we all do. The more we see, the more we learn, the more we process our own story, um, our own childhood, the things that we've experienced, um, that can create doubt in us. And so that was beginning to happen. But I, I would say for me, really, the, the biggest thing that precipitated a, a surge of doubt was when I was 18 and I spent about a year living in Mexico and I was volunteering for an orphanage for disabled orphans and um, severe disabilities. And, um, and, and it was at such a level where I really began to wrestle with why God, a good God would allow so much, so much pain and so much suffering. And, so I was 18, I didn't really have the theological framework at that time to, to really process that or digest that, um, but it was just gnawing at me. I took care of a, of a little boy named Ricky who had severe cerebral palsy. He was unable to feed himself, unable to communicate uh, using words, although he had his own ways of communicating, um, and, and his body was just severely broken. And um, I remember taking care of him just there were times you could just see in his eyes just the depth of, of pain and anguish. And um, and I just remember going on long walks um, there at the orphanage and late at night just talking to God and asking God, why? Why why, why are you allowing this? Why, why does Ricky have to suffer? Why do these kids have to suffer? And that really became the question that um, I think drove other people other beliefs, uh, other doubts, I should say, and, and other aspects of wrestling with, with my faith. You know, you look at this situation where you have a young child who is afflicted with a debilitating illness, and it's natural to, um, natural to um, question. Uh, you come off to me as somebody who's kind of probative. You've seen a miracle, a miracle of marriage being restored, and um, knowing that your faith was completely reinforced by seeing a prayer answered. And so now yep. you would have a full expectation. You go down, you meet this young boy with cerebral palsy, and 
my, you know, I prayed my dad home. Um, I can pray the cerebral palsy off of this boy. And I'm sure you spent many an hour uh, in devout prayer for this young child and God didn't answer you this time. And so is this the 50-50 God? Does he just answer the prayers that um, um, my mother tells me to pray? So do I just call my mother and say, am I supposed to pray for this little boy or am I not? You know, where, where do the instructions of God come from and how do they get to us? Not everything that makes the headlines has biblical importance, but many events that happen around the world do, and you never hear about them. Igniting a Nation is pleased to teach Revealing Prophecy every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the Marriott 280 in Birmingham. We will cover worldwide events and insider information that will connect the dots of what's happening around the world with biblical prophecy. If you happen to miss a class, we'll televise each week's class at 10 o'clock Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our social media outlets. Copies of the teachings will also be available to purchase on our website at www.IgnitingAnation.com. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website www.ignitingandnation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. If you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel, but nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingAnation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Dominic Doan, author of When Faith Fails, Finding God in the Shadow of Doubt. Dominic, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Dominic, we were, when we uh, went to break, we were talking about this young boy in Mexico with cerebral palsy. 
and these walks that you would go on wondering, um, and this is that seed of doubt is getting planted mm -hmm. in you. Here you are really radically uh, sold out on the fact that your parents were reconciled and answered a prayer, a miraculous, truly miraculous answer to prayer. And here you are serving in a missionary capacity, serving the Lord, taking care of the needs of a young boy with cerebral palsy and wondering how can a loving God afflict a child or a young man with such a debilitating disease and my prayers are not bringing about his healing. Mm -hmm. How were you feeling at the time? And was this the start? Was this the first seed on a journey that lasted for a season or two? I would say it began then, and that the doubt, the seeds of doubt that were planted just slowly began to grow. Um, a few years after that, I became a missionary in a place called Vanuatu. And Vanuatu is in the South Pacific. I actually opened open the book with a story from Vanuatu. It's a very, very uh, primitive country um, called by sociologists, uh, one of the most primitive countries on earth. And it really felt like stepping into uh, a National Geographic special. And I had the opportunity there uh, to teach through the Bible. Uh, to a group of students who came from a number of different islands. There were about 20 to 30 different uh, students. And we just took them through the Bible every year. So I was there for the course of about three years. And I would say in Mexico, where I really began to wrestle with doubts about the character of God and why he would allow suffering. It was that season in Vanuatu in my early 20s where I began to wrestle with, with questions about the Bible. I was teaching the Bible every day. It's a beautiful, life-giving, incredible book, um, but also it's a book that is filled with a, a lot of things that can fuel our doubts, uh, whether it's some of the violent texts or um, perhaps some of the commands that are hard to understand, uh, some of the confusing bits or bits that maybe at first glance seem contradictory. And so there I, I began to ask questions um, about Scripture. Um, again, not, not disbelieving Scripture, but just wandering and wrestling with with certain aspects of it um i start the book with with a story of the of the language that they spoke um in in vanuatu they speak a language called bislama which is kind of a cross of tarzan meets caveman meets pig latin and for example the word slingshot uh which they use to to capture their and kill their food um there's no walmarts there or anything um so you catch your own food and cook it every day and so they get these slingshots to, to get birds. And um, the word slingshot in Bislama is elastic, blong, shoot em, pigeon. Um, or the, the word piano, um, you wouldn't say piano. You'd say any one box where he got white teeth, blong him. Moe got black teeth, blong him. Most suppose you kill him, teeth, blong him. Him he sing out long you. So that's the word piano, which you can imagine going through the book of Romans and coming across the word propitiation, realize that would take you know, several months to, to explain in their language. And so I, I found this chasm of, of language. And, and, and that, in many ways, um, I think typifies, uh, symbolizes where I was at in my walk with the Lord, where at times reading God's word felt like this is a strange language. And I'm trying to understand portions of it that, that are creating doubt. So like many, many followers of Jesus, um, it's the same doubts I think we all wrestle with. Suffering, why is there a hard, hardship? Uh, scripture, how do we understand the Bible? Um, and, and as I grew up, late teens, early 20s, mid 20s, late 20s, I think those questions only begin to, to grow more. So here you are, um, had you already um, gone to college or did you do your missionary work prior to? Yeah, I kind of did things in reverse. <laughs> so I, uh, when I was 18, I, I graduated high school and went straight to the mission field in Mexico. After that, I did do a, a short school of ministry, which is kind of like a Bible college. And that was only a year program. And then I went to Vanuatu and 
teaching the Bible for three years. Um, and then coming back out of that, long story short, ended up meeting my wife. That's stories in the book, how we met. And uh, we moved to Europe for a time. And then I became a pastor in Hawaii. And it was during that time as I'm pastoring that I'm also getting my education. I'd taken some classes before, but I kind of finished it up. And, um, and then in 2010, went to the University of Oxford. So you um, have dual citizenship? No, actually, I am still a British citizen um, and a, a U.S. resident, although as of yesterday, uh, I officially applied to be a, a U.S. citizen. So we'll see what happens. Are you are you allowed to have dual citizenship with Britain? Yes. Yep. And that's what I'm hoping. OK. Um, as you're going through this struggle, um, obviously you came out the other side of it. But this battle that you were fighting, which was mind over word, um, is very real for a lot of people. It is a crisis of faith or the dark night of the soul or whatever it is you want to call it. Uh, in reality, there's, uh, fortunately, science is now catching up with the Bible and there That's are right. new discoveries being made all the time that reinforce yeah. the, the inerrancy and the truth of scripture. But going back 10 or 20 years, uh, science was at odds with Scripture. You had uh, mm -hmm. uh, Dawkins and, and Bill Nye the science guy and all mm -hmm. these other people and Darwinism and um, <coughs> things that would deny the fact that uh, every culture had a story of creation or every culture had a uh, flood or every culture had um, false gods or or um, uh, mighty men of renown, heroes, supermen, these kind of things. So it became kind of commonplace. The uh, Native American Indians had their own versions. So was it really real or was it just mythology that, that uh, became uh, the, instead of Grimm's fairy tales or Aesop's fables, became the best-selling book of mythology in all of history. Uh, how did you process your doubts? Mm. Um, are you asking from a perspective of when it comes to science? No, I'm asking how, here's a young man who has mm. experienced a miracle early on in his life, 10 years old, yeah. he sees a miracle of God. He then yeah. goes out and he sees the real world and he gets this, this taste of reality which is a little bit unsettling, a little bit shocking. This all-powerful, all-magical, all-mystical God who heals families and restores brokenness. Um, I enter the world, and the world, you go to Mexico, right, and you see poverty. You see uh, abject poverty. You see um, um, uh, a government which is uh, Mexico City, the largest city in the world, and then you see the state. I've been there, and I know what you've seen, and you wonder how can God allow this to happen. So you have this foundation of faith, which is built on the miraculous, mm -hmm. and then you have it uh, stunning in your face reality check. How does this, how do you process this? How do you hang yeah. on? What thread did, did you hold on to, um, mm. knowing that it was the hem of his garment that you refused to mm. let go of? But how did you process this? You had to have gone yeah. through some emotional, some personal, yeah. some psychological, some kind of, of process in which yeah. you were dealing with rationalization, justification, mm. evidence examination, scriptural pursuit, all that. How did yeah. you do it? Yeah, um, I would say initially my my response was, and I don't think this is a healthy response, was to suppress my doubt. And I, I think this is actually fairly common when, when believers go through times where their faith is shaken or it feels like their faith is failing. We, we often push it down because we 
wrongfully believe that our faith has no space for doubters or those who have questions. Um, sometimes our, our church traditions or communities that we're a part of um, have given us this impression that it's wrong to have doubts and it's not a safe space to wrestle with our doubts. And we're endlessly given affirmations of, okay, just believe, whether it's songs or sermons and everything's very neat and didactic. And so I, yeah, for years I felt, and this was compounded by the fact that I was actually a pastor uh, for eight years in Hawaii. Um, I, I really didn't feel there was a space for me to share my doubts or wrestle honestly with them. And so my initial response was just to suppress and push them down. But that never works. Uh, I think doubt's greatest strength is secrecy. Um, and the more we push it down, um, the more it will emerge uh, in times of hardship and crisis. Um, that's why doubt, I think, is an opportunity for us to be honest with God and with others, to bring them to the surface and, and to wrestle. Um, so when I went to Oxford in 2010, we moved from Hawaii. I really resolved in that, that two-year season, getting my master's, that I was going to really lay everything on the table and just be real with God and, and go deep in some of the issues that had been troubling me for years. And so I think that was a, a healthier response to doubt. Um, it was very difficult, to be honest, especially that first year. Um, and a lot of my degree was focused on the work of atheists and philosophy. And so that, that kind of led me down an interesting path um, where even more doubts initially began to flood my mind. But what I found was in the act of wrestling and thinking and reading and praying and having conversation, I um, became a very, very healthy thing and a response to doubt that I think uh, helped bear some fruit. And I, and I think when anyone goes through a season like this, they, they really have various options on how to deal with doubt. One is suppression, which I don't think is healthy. Uh, another option that we see growing today is deconstruction. Um, and we, we see this in a growing genre of podcasts and books that people ask questions about the Bible and, okay, well, just deconstruct it all. And none of it's really true. And it kind of takes you down a very progressive, liberal version of, of faith. Um, but at the end of that, um, anyone can tear down a house. De deconstruction is easy. Um, at the end of the day, though, you, you, you need something to live in. <laughs> you, you need something to hold on to. And so I don't think deconstruction for... Um, so I'm arguing best possible, um, and to be honest, and to go deep and to bring them before God. In dealing with a segment of our population, which is the millennials, which is a very rapidly growing segment that are questioning uh, relevancy of Scripture, questioning relevancy of the church, questioning relevancy and what difference are we actually making? Is this really, you know, gathering on Sunday for an hour, is that relevant? Does that do anything? Does that accomplish anything? Uh, in struggling with doubt, uh, finding faith when faith fails, is this something that we're, we're at the forefront of in a generation that's growing up questioning already the relevance of faith, the relevance of the Bible, the relevance of the church, and it's now a um, starting point as opposed to a mid-faith crisis. Uh, it's a starting point where yeah. you're beginning with doubt. You're That's beginning, right. yeah. you, you're not in the throes of I believe, but now forgive my unbelief. You're in the throes mm -hmm. of I don't have any evidence to believe in. I've been yeah. educated yeah. in a system yep. that's told me that that Darwinism is it, evolution is it, um, science yeah. science reigns supreme, uh, quantum yeah. physics is more powerful than the Bible, and I start right. out that way. Okay, yeah. how do how do we reach them with this? 
Uh, mm -hmm. and, and how do we approach this doubt when the doubt is there at the beginning? Yeah, that is a, that's a brilliant question. And you're right. We, we are in an interesting cultural moment where more and more the default position is skepticism and unbelief. Whereas, you know, a number of years ago in, in our nation, um, the default position, and, and I think certain pockets in our nation too, um, the default position is faith. And what church do you go to? Everyone goes to church, but that's changing. Um, I live in Portland, Oregon, and it's one of the most progressive kind of liberal cities in America, one of the least church cities in America. So it's kind of the air that we breathe here. Um, James K. Smith, you know, he, he writes about this and he says, that we, we're all Thomas now. <laughs> it, our, this secular age has really bred um, a, a generation of, of doubters and, and skeptics and cynics. Um, I, I, would, I would suggest that that, although it looks bleak, if you're a follower of Jesus or in ministry and you think, oh no, this, you know, everything's just falling apart, in, in some sense it's true. But I think Leonard Cohen, he said that, um, there's a crack in everything, right? That's how the light gets in. And I, I think there is a crack even in secularism, and that is skepticism and disbelief can only work for so long, that there's something in the human heart that innately yearns for more. God's put eternity in our hearts. And no matter who the person is or what they've been trained to believe or what their worldview is, there's still that longing, there's still that yearning, and there's still the, the, the awareness that there has to be something more than their, their secular worldview. And so I think even, even the skeptic doubts, even the, if they're a true skeptic, <laughs> if, if, they're, if they're a true uh, cynical individual, they're gonna have doubts about their worldview. They're, they're gonna ask hard questions. Um, a believer, you know, C.S. Lewis, he said that there are days I wake up and I don't even know if I'm a Christian, you know, and then the afternoon rolls around and, and oh, yeah, I am. And, um, we, the believer doubts the existence of God um, or the goodness of God or why. And, and so, too, the unbeliever. They, they will doubt their disbelief in God. And so that's one of the points I make in the book is everyone doubts. We all have, have uncertainties. But what worldview is more plausible? And, and this is where doubt actually can become the crack that lets the light in. Doubt can become a, a motivating force in our life that pushes us in the quest for truth. And I believe if you're honest with those doubts, whether you're coming at it from a secular perspective or a Christian perspective, it will lead you to, to God. Yeah, I think what you've done is you have taken the stigma of doubt and you've given a, a kind of a book of permission. Um, I, Dominic, give you permission to doubt. Uh, yeah. I want to create a safe environment of doubt. I want to help you explore doubt. I want you to go down the path of doubt. I want you to look into doubt. I want you to doubt, uh, use the same application that you doubt scripture to science. I want you to use the same application that you doubt um, a loving father to, to um, how you parent, to how your children perceive you, how you relate to your community. I want you to doubt. I want you to take, let's start your position as a position of doubt. And then let us walk you through how to process. And, and it's, it's interesting that it's, it's in a faith-based um, genre, but it really is a handbook of processing doubt. How, how do I process mm -hmm. doubt? How do I reconcile doubt? How do I allow myself space to doubt, yet still have a firm foundation of belief that allows for doubt? And I think right. that we've created an environment in the church that says either you believe it all or you don't believe any of it. Either you That's take right. it exactly as it is or you take yeah. none of it. And we've got this all or yeah. nothing proposition and I do believe that in the inerrancy of the Word of God but that's my position um, do I promote that position I do but I also promote the fact that when I go through a time of crisis that I cry out and doubt and say 
how could you let this happen? How could you yep. do this to me? How could, and look, Joseph, 25 years from the time he had the dream to the time the dream was fulfilled. All right, we don't read of his doubt, okay? Mm -hmm. But in the natural inclination of man, there had to be some form of doubt that occurred, some form of questioning. How did I go from being the chosen son to being thrown into a pit, to being thrown into slavery, to be accused of adultery, to be put into prison, now to be serving Pharaoh, but he brought about through his experience the restoration of my people and the pathway for the birth of the Messiah. Uh, important mm -hmm. work in a season of really, there was 13 years of complete silence. Uh, there mm -hmm. was the same 13 years of complete silence to Abraham, where God mm -hmm. did not speak to Abraham for 13 years. Mm -hmm. Complete silence. He talked to him all the time for a period of time, and then he went quiet for 13 yep. years. He, you don't think you, you, you don't hear anything, nothing whatsoever? You're going to have a little mm. bit of doubt. Uh, yeah. that, that's natural. That's real. That's right. Uh, that's right. So it's almost as if the book is, um, I, I, Dominic, give you permission to doubt. Okay? And if you're going to doubt, let me give you a reasonable way to process yeah. your doubt. Yeah. Let me help, navig help you navigate a real concept of doubt without denying your faith, without denying science, without denying reality, without denying God. Mm -hmm. So in your approach to this, how do you offer, what are some of the practical ways that you offer people to navigate doubt? Mm. Yeah, so the, the last third of the book is dedicated to that. Um, I begin with the story of Jacob wrestling with God as a template for how to process our doubts. I just love that story because Jacob, he too, like like the characters you mentioned, Joseph and others, he, he would have struggled with his own doubt and crisis of faith. He, he had an inherited of faith from his father. Um, he was part of a family of faith. And yet Jacob, he, he needed to make his faith his own. And he needed to come to a place where uh, Yahweh wasn't just a abstract idea, but, but something that was real to him that, that would act absolutely change his life. And so one night God met him and they, and they wrestled. And I, I love that story because Jacob, he, he was willing to go deep. He was willing to ask questions. He was willing to allow God to break him. And he came to a point of desperation where he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And I, I think when we come to God with our doubts in that way, not trivially setting them aside um, or superficially trying to answer them with someone else's answers, but when we come to God honestly broken with raw and ragged questions and say, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me, until you begin to speak to me, until you change me, until you reveal yourself to me, God will. And Jacob, he clung to God. And God changed his name. <laughs> he changed Jacob. And I think wrestling with doubt looks that way, where we may not walk away with all the answers, but in the act of wrestling with God, we would have been changed. Our name has been transformed. He becomes Israel at that point. And it's changed, it became a template for the people of God. And I think it's a template for our own life as well that we, we come from a long line of wrestlers. Um, I love what you said earlier, how you, you believe in the inerrancy of scripture, um, but that still gives you space to, to ask questions. And, and I think it's because we believe in the inerrancy of scripture that we ask questions, because the, the authors of scripture, um, inspired by God, asked some of the hardest questions that could be asked, you know, Richard Dawkins and others, atheists today who think that they've got us pinned in a corner by asking the tough questions, um, God delusion or religion poisons everything and God doesn't exist. And here's why, because there's suffering in the world or the Bible's weird or whatever. Well, you know what? Those same questions were asked 
thousands of years before. And it was by, and it's because we have a high view of Scripture that we understand that there is a space to say, how long, O oh Lord, like David did, or my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, uh, like Jesus did. Um, so I think prayer, wrestling with God, is one way to process our doubts. I think going to Scripture and identifying with the voices of those who, who doubted and hearing how they processed it can be beautiful and enriching. I think community is a vital way to process our doubt. We're, we're not meant to do this alone. We need others in our life who can speak in, into our lives to be honest with us, who can pray for us, who can help carry our burdens. Um, I think a commitment to learn that when you have a doubt, go all in. Um, I've had so many conversations with people. Um, they, they, they have an issue with, let's say, Scripture as an example. What, why is the Bible so violent? Um, and yet, rather than really engaging with that and, and reading the good material and some of the answers that are out there, um, they, they, they'll just read half of God delusion or something and say, okay, I'm abandoning my faith and I'm walking away. And I write this book to say, no, don't go for the low hanging fruit. Like if you have a specific doubt, go all in, read the best arguments on both sides, R really learn. You'll, you'll find in the process of learning um, that there are some beautiful answers out there. Um, so that's another way I think we can, we can process our doubts. And then two, um, I, I close the book by talking about just the art of letting go. And one of the beautiful minimizing effects of doubt is that it can cause us to re-examine our faith and and actually ask honest questions about this doubt that I'm having about my faith. Maybe it's illuminating a weakness in my particular perspective of this theological position that I need to change. Um, and that, that can be a good thing. Um, and in some cases, it, it's a letting go of the doubt itself where we realize, you know, I've wrestled with it. I don't think I know the answer. I don't know if I ever will know the answer. Um, but I'm, I'm letting it go and I'm choosing to trust you anyway and choosing to live in the tension of a faith that hasn't fully yet been resolved. You know, when we look at uh, throwing a stone into a, a pebble into a pool of water, yeah, we, we see that ripple effect. Uh, when you threw the pebble into the water, the water was smooth. It had come to a point of resolution where there was nothing acting upon it. And mm. now your doubt comes and acts upon it and sends ripples through it. Yeah. And the ripples go out right, until they come against something which is immovable and ultimately then quiets itself down. Uh, I believe that God presents us in scripture, uh, things which are puzzling, things which are maybe even weird. Dr. Michael Heiser says, if it appears to be weird or odd in the Bible, it must be very important. Yes. Oh, I like that. <laughs> and so it's worth pursuing. It's yeah, worth digging right. into. If you don't understand yeah. it when you read it, don't accept the fact that you don't understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why it says to study the Bible mm -hmm. to show yourself approved of God. It should be taken as a challenge. And certainly there yes. are seeds of doubt. There were, you know, Thomas uh, presented to Jesus. Um, look, you know, until I'd stick my fingers, you know, you know, uh, until I touch you, I'm not gonna believe it. I can see with my eyes, right, unless I put my hands in your scarred hands, unless I put my hands in your peace side, I'm not going to believe that it's really you. Um, that would, that was acceptable. That was not punishable by death. Oh, you touch me, you die. Um, it was something that said, if this is what you need in order to believe, then I will provide that for you because I am that loving, I am that giving, mm -hmm. that I will yeah. meet you exactly in your season of doubt. I will meet you yeah. exactly where you are. It's okay yeah. to be there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Jesus didn't didn't get angry with Thomas. Um, he didn't kick him out <laughs> for being part of the twelve. 
Um, but he, he allowed him to wrestle. And here's and yet he he still had doubts he still had uncertainties um and and I, i'm glad that story is there <laughs> i really am because if he doubted and jesus was standing right before him then there will be times like i haven't seen the resurrected jesus so it's pretty pretty normal i think for us to have to have uncertainties and i love too at the end in, in matthew when jesus sent out his disciples there's that little verse there that I'd read for years and it never had hit me uh, like it did a couple years ago where it says some believed and some doubted. <laughs> some some worshipped him. Uh, some still had questions. But Jesus sent them both out. He, he, he said, go into the world, preach the gospel. He didn't separate the doubters from the worshipers. He didn't say, okay, doubters, you need more training, you know, <laughs> or you're kind of off the team, voted Mission, this great commitment uh, to go and, and bring the gospel for all of us. Uh, there's room for those who have doubts, or room for those who have questions. There's room for those who, who just have a strong and seemingly unshakable faith, too. You know, I would wonder what would happen this Sunday if you opened up the service and said to the ushers, um, if, uh, I want you to have a section marked off for doubters. Yes. <laughs> all right. And and uh, I want all the doubters to sit over here, and I want all the absolutely 100% sure, immovable, unshakable, never have a doubt sit over here. Yeah. Would anybody honestly sit mm. on that one side of the congregation? And when we realize that this assembly that we have, do not forsake the assembly of the brethren, uh, yeah. study to show yourself approved of God is because you are a doubter. You were yeah. created a doubter. As a matter of fact, the book of Genesis is not the story of creation, it's the book of separation. Everything mm. in Genesis was separated. Man mm -hmm. was separated from woman, uh, light was separated from darkness, water was separated from the earth, the heavens were separated above and below. Everything was separated until man was finally separated from God. Mm, and yeah. then there's 65 books to come after that that are the path to return. So, right. so God is the God, uh, certainly he is the God who is certain, but since he is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent, mm -hmm. he too mm -hmm. right, allows for doubt because when we violated the covenant in the garden, Mm -hmm. And we ate from the forbidden tree. We did it out of doubt in mm -hmm. belief that what he said, this was what, what Satan's mm -hmm. first false prophecy. Did yep. God really say to you? Yeah. Okay. Did he really say to you? Okay. Yeah. And then we hear this, 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 this convoluted answer. Uh, not only did he say we couldn't eat it, but he said that we couldn't touch it. Well, first of all, God never spoke to Eve. So the whole, the whole dialogue, the whole narrative mm. is, mm. is fallacious. It's, yep. it's, it's fictitious. God didn't yep. give the instruction to Eve. Adam gave the instruction to Eve. And then yeah. in the discourse between Adam and God, the very first thing he does is blames God. He says, <laughs> the woman you gave me, yeah. the, you did this. The woman you gave me, she's the one that gave me the fruit. All I did was eat. I'm like the least. Yeah. of these. And so doubt crept in early right. on into yeah. the faith journey because yeah. until you find that place of assurance, yeah. then you don't own your faith. Your yeah. faith is owned by somebody else and you've adopted their faith. And it, yeah. if you don't have doubt, then you cannot have surety. And if you mm -hmm. don't have surety, then you can't own your own faith. And so mm -hmm. I believe it's part of the way that God wove the fabric of our faith is that in that fabric are threads of doubt yeah, that's that right. are in there that when we come to them, if you have a yeah. hole, you sew it up. What do you sew it yeah. up with? You don't sew it up with a thread of doubt. You right. sew it up with something that's stronger that's going to hold it and bind it together so it's not going to break there again. 
And so yeah. God allows for that, encourages that, allows mm -hmm. for that questioning so we can be in a relationship. If I don't yeah. question you or discuss with you, I don't have a relationship with you. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I, I use the example in chapter one of my wife, Elisa, and I don't know everything about her. Um, I think one of the beautiful things of, of relationship and marriage and friendship is that as years go by, you still discover new things about them. And so there's a certain element of, of mystery to, to my wife. You know, she'll surprise me. Oh, I didn't know you liked that song or I didn't know you liked that style of food or whatever. And, and it's because of that mystery and it's because I'm learning new things about her. I think that keeps the relationship alive and vibrant. I mean, if I literally knew everything about my wife, every thought, every emotion, everything she was going to say before she said it, um, every placement of at every atom, not only would that be slightly creepy, but uh, mystery is the is the lifeblood of intimacy, and it's because there are questions that are aching to be asked, and um, things that are still need to be resolved, and things I'm learning about her that keeps the journey of the relationship alive. It, it makes me want to get to know her more, and I think the same thing is true in our relationship with God. God is omniscient, like you said, and on, omnipotent, and eternal, and omnipresent, and this God of infinite. Uh, capacities makes a world that is finite and because we live in a finite world and we have finite brains and finite time and finite health and fi finite Wi-Fi capacity um, it's because of these things that doubt exists it's kind of built into the fabric of of the universe um, but redeemed doubt will say rather than use to I use my doubt as an opportunity to pursue God. And Satan, in, in Genesis 3, he uses doubt in, in a way that was unredemptive, and in a way that pushed people away from God. And doubt can do that. But redeemed doubt goes the other direction. <laughs> redeemed doubt says, like Jacob, I'm going to wrestle. Redeemed doubt says, I want to go deeper. Redeemed doubt says, you know, I may not know all the answers, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue God even in the midst of it. If you're struggling with doubt, welcome to the club because we all do. And if we're honest with yeah. ourselves, we have doubts about a lot of things that we read in Scripture because we are taught to walk by faith and not by sight. But the natural body is designed where our eye gates are the very first thing that exposes us to what we would call reality. And so when we come to the area of faith, Faith is something that's not seen. We come into that doorway of doubt. But if you're struggling with doubt in this book, When Faith Fails, Finding God in the Shadow of Doubt will not only give you answers that you've been seeking, but it will give you permission to doubt and to explore that doubt and to make your doubt adventurous, to make your doubt a journey, and to make the fulfillment and the discovery exciting and vibrant and new every time you come to a new revelation. Dominic Doan, author of When Faith Fails, Finding God and the Shadow of Doubt, thank you for sharing this amazing story with us here on Revealing the Truth. Thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. God bless. We're going to take a short break, God bless you. and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.